everybody. I am Samuel Drigo Sharo. I am a lecturer in the Department of Animal Breeding and Genetics, Federal University of Agriculture, Abiy Obutabu State, Nigeria. I'm also a postdoctoral fellow at the Department of Animal Sciences, Purdue University, West Lafayette, Indiana, in the United States. And I work on welfare and behavior of turkeys and chickens. And I'm particularly interested in looking at how breed, genotype, sex, and genetic variations such as a single nucleotide polymorphism affect livestock behavior. So you are all welcome to Animal Welfare Group Nigeria with acronym AWGN. AWGN was funded in 2019 after a meeting of some lecturers and students from Federal University of Agriculture, Abiyokuta, Ogun State, Nigeria. And the missions of AWGN are one, to increase awareness about animal welfare and behavior in Nigeria, Africa, and the world at large. Number two is to foster collaboration and networking among researchers who are in the field of animal welfare and behavior. And the third objective is to educate the public on the importance of animal welfare. And we meet every first and third Wednesdays to discuss issues that are related to animal welfare and behavior. And scientists from different parts of the world have presented on issues that are related to animal welfare and behavior on this platform. And today's presentation is the second inaugural lecture in the year 2022 and the fifth inaugural lecture on animal welfare group Nigeria. We have had some other scientists like uh, Professor Dona Broom, uh, Tempu Grandin, uh, Tina Widowski, and Ruth Newberry that have presented uh, their own inaugural lectures. And today's presenter is Dr. Lisa Young of the University of Nottingham, United Kingdom. Lisa will be talking on using behavior to measure welfare in captive elephants. And today's moderator is Dr. Luashim Yasiri of the Department of Animal uh, Physiology, Federal University of Agriculture, Abeokuta, Ogun State, Nigeria. And he's, she's also an, uh, a Von Humboldt Fellow in Germany. And I would love to hand over to Dr. Luashim to continue the program. Thank you. Thank you so much. And well, uh, I want to welcome everybody to today's meeting. Like the host said, today is the we are having the fifth virtual inaugural uh, lecture on the Animal Welfare Group Nigeria. And we are happy to have Dr. Lisa Young in our midst, giving the first presentation on wildlife, animal, and elephants in particular. So this is quite interesting to me, and I believe it's also interesting to all of you. And I hope um, you have a lot to learn, and please, uh, as she's presenting her work, kindly drop your questions in the chat box and we will take the questions immediately after her presentation. So before we start, I would like to take the biography of our presenter. Dr. Lisa Young is an associate professor in zoo and wildlife medicine in the School of Veterinary Medicine and Sciences at the University of Nottingham, United Kingdom. She is a veterinarian with a PhD in elephant endocrine, endocrine physiology. For more than 10 years, she has headed the behavior subgroup and more recently also vice chair of uh, Behazas Africa Elephant Welfare Group, working in partnership with UK elephant holding facilities to work to assess and improve captive elephant welfare. In this role, she also led the development and validation of an elephant behavioral welfare assessment tool, which was designed for routine use by elephant keepers to enable them to monitor their, ele their elephant's welfare over time. This tool has been used by the UK elephant holding facilities since 2015 and has since been developed into an Android app. Dr. Young leads the Elephant Welfare Project, which provides vet students the opportunity to engage in outreaches, fundraising, social media, research, and networking activities with members of the public. 
and stakeholders at captive elephant facilities all across the globe. Dr. Young's experience on elephant welfare is recognized both nationally and internationally. Her research has had direct and substantial impact on government policy in both UK and Ireland. And she contributed to the development of standards for care of captive elephants at tourist facilities in Southern Africa. She also served as consultant for the Catalan government on captive elephant welfare. Dr. Young has engaged in extensive knowledge exchange and outreach activities relating to her research. This has included the dissemination through radio and video interviews, through invited talks at schools and universities, and invited public presentations. She has also organized and taken part in numerous seminars and work workshops for people in the captive elephant industry in the UK and in Africa and in Asia. So I want to welcome uh, Dr. Lisa Young to our midst. And thank you very much indeed. And thank you for inviting me today. Um, so I, I thought what I would do is to just explain how we went about developing and validating our um, behavioral welfare assessment tool um, for use in ele uh, with elephants, but particularly for use by elephant keepers or the people that are working directly with them. So, um, as I said, I'm going to be looking at welfare assessments in captive elephants. Um, when we have wild animals in captivity, it's important to have a scientifically validated way to evaluate their welfare so that we can monitor their well being over time. But before we talk about developing a tool to measure welfare, it's important that we clearly define what it is that we're trying to measure. Welfare is something that involves both physical and mental health. An animal with good or positive welfare engages well with both their physical and their social environment. And they have the opportunity to exercise choice and have control or agency. And welfare is very much about the individual animal. It is affected by many individual factors, including an animal's age, their sex, and their prior experiences. Measures of welfare should be able to detect changes in welfare state over time. And validation of that tool should involve an assessment of whether the measures can consistently and reliably predict this. A good measure should be able to detect differences in welfare states between different elephants, and their reliability and validity should be tested using rigorous scientific methodology. So these are some commonly used measures of welfare in captive wildlife, which have been used in elephants. Um, and I've highlighted in red the really common ones. So resource-based measures are important for management decisions. We know that an animal's physical resources and their social ones are an important part of allowing them to express natural behavior. Others include health or physical measures like body condition, health, and ill health physical activity or movement, and physiological measures such as glucocorticoids, that is cortisol or corticosterone, and heart rate. Many of these measures are preferred because they involve only single or infrequent measurements, which will enable a fairly rapid assessment. So you can get a clear quantitative result, which is satisfying, and it provides the impression of doing really rigorous science. And these measures can certainly be useful and there is certainly evidence of their potential links with welfare, but there are also some important caveats or, or cautions in using these measures. So for example, consider the measurement of physical activity. Some researchers have looked at the distance a captive elephant walked by attaching an accelerometer on an anklet and measuring how far the elephant walked during a day. And they then compared that to the distance that a wild elephant will walk in a day. For at least some of the facilities, the figures were fairly comparable to wild elephants, and they concluded that this therefore meant that these elephants had good welfare because they had a similar level of physical activity. But if you just look at distance walked, you might be missing something. So 
these, the researchers that took this video were looking at an elephant walking in a zoo. And if you just watched the elephant for a little while, it might simply be, seem to be walking around its enclosure. And that might indicate fairly good welfare in terms of their locomotion. But the researchers sped up the footage so that they could more easily see what was happening. And once they did, they could readily see that the elephant was in fact doing what's called root tracing in a figure eight pattern. This is an abnormal repetitive behavior or stereotypy, which is understood to be a coping behavior, helping the animal to deal with stress that either exists now or that they experienced in the past. Another common measure is looking at the levels of the hormone cortisol. So when an animal is stressed, the brain stimulates the adrenal gland, which is a small paired gland located just above the kidneys. And the adrenal gland then releases the hormone cortisol. So when an animal is stressed, they may have increased cortisol and this hormone can be measured and the levels can be tracked in the blood and in other types of samples. But it turns out that stress isn't the only thing that increases cortisol. Feeding, can also stimulate the body to make more cortisol. And reproductive activity will also result in higher cortisol levels. And high levels of physical activity will also elevate cortisol. So it's clear from these examples that stress isn't the only thing that causes increased levels of cortisol. Another measure that is increasingly used in welfare assessment is heart rate or heart rate variability. But both of these measures are also affected by excitement or activity. So for all of these physiological measures, it's clear that it's important to know the context in which they were collected. In addition, these types of assessments may require specialist training and expertise and access to special equipment. They can also be difficult to interpret and may be costly to measure. So observations of behavior can serve to provide context for these physiological measures. It can provide a lot of information about the internal state of an animal. However, if we're going to use behavior as an indicator of welfare, it's important that we are evaluating the behaviors that are important welfare indicators and that we're measuring them in the right way. A good behavioral tool should include a suite, a panel of different related measures. So it should include things like abnormal behaviors and a look at their time budgets or how much time they spend doing different activities. The, the behavioral measures should be reliable and valid and repeatable. And it's really important that they're able to differentiate between elephants that are in different welfare states. We recently created a new welfare assessment tool for use in elephants, which uses observed behaviors to help judge an individual elephant's welfare. It was designed for use by elephant keepers or others working with captive elephants, and it was designed to be a rapid and reliable tool that's using validated methodology. It was also designed to monitor changes in welfare over time. When we began designing our tool, we started by going to the literature to identify behavioral indicators of welfare. So we considered the different methods that can be used to measure these. And then we sifted those based on the strength of evidence of that measure and also the feasibility for use by keepers at captive facilities. We then created a prototype tool and determined the reliability and the validity of that tool. And then we developed a final version only retaining those measures that met the thresholds that we set for reliability and validity. So that's kind of an overview of what we did. And now I'm going to talk about each of these steps in more detail. So to start with, we wanted to identify behavioral indicators of welfare. So we did this by first looking at the peer reviewed literature. We consulted a number of scientific databases using a set of pre-identified search terms to capture papers about elephants, management, and welfare. And we used a strict criteria 
of inclusion and exclusion for the papers that we evaluated. We then undertook a critical appraisal of the papers that we found, reviewing the sample size, the design of the study, the welfare measures that were used and methods undertaken. These results were then used by our expert advisory panel with whom we worked to identify those welfare measures with the strongest evidence. In addition to peer reviewed literature, there are many other sources of information that are important for understanding elephant welfare. And we thought it was important to include these. These included books and conference proceedings. We also searched for papers in keeper journals, such as Rattel, which can serve as an important source of otherwise unpublished knowledge accumulated by those working directly with elephants on a daily basis. We also used internet searches of key terms and snowballing by searching the reference lists of relevant literature. We identified additional key papers from members of our expert advisory panels, and we included unpublished studies sent to us by the British and Irish Association of Zoos and Aquariums and by some UK elephant holding zoos. Expert opinion can also serve as an important source of evidence, particularly in a field where there is a lot of practical knowledge that doesn't get published in peer reviewed journals. And it can be especially important when there isn't much published literature on a topic. So we therefore also used focus group teleconferences with people working in zoos, as well as those studying elephant welfare or behavior in captive or free living populations. And we used an expert advisory panel comprised of animal welfare scientists, veterinarians, and those studying elephants in captivity in the wild. After we identified our different behavioral welfare measures, we created a prototype tool, which we then set out to test to determine both its reliability and its validity. Our prototype tool had 76 unique behavioral measures of welfare in elephants. We then undertook a study to evaluate the reliability and validity of these measures. So in these, we worked with five UK zoos that represented a range of different facilities and different contact systems. So both free contact and protected contact, both African and Asian elephants, different group sizes and different levels of relatedness amongst the elephants. In total, there were 29 elephants, 24 female and five male, nine African and 20 Asian. Behavior, welfare, or psychometric tool will require validation over a number of studies. And we undertook initial validation as follows. So we looked first at face validity, which is that an item appears to ask what it should, that there's a logical explanation underpinning the item. So in our study, we used items that were identified from prior literature and which were reviewed by the expert advisory panel. For internal reliability, this is correlation between items within components that are supposed to measure the same thing. So in our study, we used Kronbach's alpha looking at correlation between items within the tool that are expected to measure the same thing. We looked at test retest reliability, which is the consistency of answers within the same animal where they're expected to be in the same welfare state. So we rated the same animal after a few weeks when it was expected that it was in the same welfare state. We looked at inter and intra rater reliability. So this is the consistency within and between raters at the same time or within a short time frame on the same animal. So in our study, we looked at the consistency of scores of the same animal at the same time for inter rater reliability or the same observation using a video camera for intra rater reliability. And we also looked at concurrent or known groups criterion validity. This is results compared to external independent criterion measure, the gold standard or an alternative measure, and it may include natural behavior. So in our study, we compared our results to an ethogram used at an interval of five minutes over three days and three nights of behavior. So 72 hours of footage for each elephant. So in terms of the concurrent validity, the ethogram, we use three days and three nights of footage, as I mentioned. And for the ethogram, the different behaviors that we looked at included stereotypies, wallowing, dust bathing, interaction with water, 
feeding and foraging, locomotion, affiliative behavior, agonistic behavior, play, interaction with the environment, and both lying and standing rest. We applied thresholds of reliability and validity to our new tool, and we only used those measures which met the thresholds, and these were then included in our final behavioral welfare assessment tool. So the tool consists of three different sections. Both daytime and nighttime observations were included. So the daytime observations were spread across each day so that an observation was made in each of four time slots. One observation between 9 and 11 a.m., one between 11 a.m. and 1 p.m., one between 1 and 3 p.m., and one observation between 3 and 5 p.m. In section A, which is the qualitative behavioral assessment part of the tool, this involved those four observations that were made on a single day. Section B involves observations Again, four observations on a day, but uh, that, that is then repeated on three consecutive days. And then nighttime behavioral observations are collected over one full night. So section A, this involves qualitative behavioral assessment or QBA. And QBA involves making live observations on one day for our tool. So the keeper will observe their elephant for one minute each time. And again, their observations are spread into each of four time slots across the day. So they'll watch their elephants. They'll do one minute of observation between 9 and 11 a.m., once between 11 and 1 p.m., once between 1 and 3 p.m., and once between 3 and 5 p.m. And after they watch their elephant for a minute, they will then rate that elephant's demeanor. So QBA involves looking beyond simply characterizing the behavior that you see. For example, in both of these photos, you might characterize the behavior quite similarly on an ethogram where you're noting down all the behaviors an animal displays. Both of these elephants are standing, so they might look the same if you're using an ethogram to simply note down their behavior. But if you use QBA, you say that, well, these elephants are standing, but they're they're doing something, there's a difference between them still. We would say that they're standing in a different way, that there's a different expression on their faces. And if you were to try and imagine what they're feeling, you'd say that they're feeling a different emotion in these two different images. So when you use QBA, you're thinking about what it's like to be that elephant in that situation. So you're judging their demeanor or their emotional state. And in the tool, after the keeper watches the elephant for one minute, they then rate the elephant's demeanor using a series of adjectives. And so they have to rate how much they think that a particular adjective applies to an elephant's demeanor at a particular point in time. So for example, they would rate the elephant on the adjective content after they watch them for a minute. And you can see on this uh, visual analog scale, there are anchors at each extreme end of the scale. So this end would mean that the elephant is completely content. The most content that you could imagine the elephant being, they're completely at ease, tranquil and satisfied. And at this end of the scale, they seem not content at all, ill at ease, not tranquil at all, not satisfied. And then you'd place a tick mark along that line on where you feel that elephant's demeanor sits at that particular point in time. And the keepers do that similarly for each of the adjectives. And so the adjectives included in the, the tool are content, wary, relaxed, playful, agitated, uncomfortable, tense, and frustrated. So QBA, Qualitative Behavior Assessment, allows us to draw on the expertise of the people that work with the animals to help interpret their body language. QBA has been scientifically validated as a way to capture another dimension of an animal's welfare. The assessor evaluates the animal's demeanor. And using QBA provides a more holistic assessment of that animal's well-being than simply observing behavior. And also, crucially, it provides a way to assess not only the negative, but also positive welfare, which is something that's increasingly recognized 
as important for all animals, including captive wildlife, but it can be difficult to measure. Um, the other daytime section of the tool, section B, involves four five-minute behavioral observations. Um, so on a given day, these five-minute behavioral observations will be spread in each of the four time slots. And then for this section, the observations are made for in each of these four time slots for three days in a row. And during each five minute observation period, the assessor will no doubt note down any time that they see any of the behaviors that are included on the checklist. So this includes playing, wallowing, feeding or foraging, affiliative behavior, locomotion, agonistic behavior and stereotypies. The nighttime section of the tool, section C, involves the observing, observer noting down how often the elephant shows different overnight behaviors. So what they do is they review overnight video footage and do scan sampling of behaviors at 30 minute intervals. And in particular, they're asked to note down any time they see stereotypies, sleep, feeding, interacting with the environment, and self-maintenance behaviors such as dust bathing. They're also asked to quickly review the entire night of footage to identify if there were any instances of aggression, and if there were, they must provide details on who initiated the aggression and who was the recipient, details about the type of aggressive behavior shown and what was happening at the time. So keepers have been using this tool in the UK since 2015, and we've had some nice feedback from keepers about the tool and how it's helped them. So they've commented, it forces you to observe your elephants more, which you normally don't have time for. The more you use it, you understand behaviors better. It can make any problems clear and also any improvements. And I'm more confident with what to look for in elephant behavior. And recently, we also created an Android app of our tool to make it faster and easier for, for people to use our tool to evaluate their elephants. So although our tool was designed to be fairly quick to complete, it does require that keepers print out pieces of paper and then carry them around with them to make multiple observations over multiple days. And then at the end of that time, they have to transfer all of their results onto the computer. So we created a new Android app of the tool to make it faster and easier to use. The app allows keepers to enter their observations directly onto the tablet, and it provides step-by-step -step guidance on how to complete each section of the tool. Results are scored on the tablet, and reports can then be uploaded onto our database, and a report of their scores is automatically generated and sent out to the person submitting the scores. So the report that's automatically generated for each elephant at each zoo includes a series of tables and graphs. And this slide shows an example report for an elephant. On the left side, you can see categories graphed for three separate dates on which assessments were made. And you can see that each category is a different color to make it easier for the facilities to see each of the categories on the graph. On the right, you can see a pie chart at the top showing the different frequencies of overnight behaviors for the most recently submitted report. And underneath this is a stacked bar chart that, um, where each bar represents nighttime behavior for different dates for that elephant. And these graphs and charts were designed to make it easier for zoos to see trends in their elephant's behavior over time. And there's also a member's online portal that people can log on to. And they can then choose which elephant they want to review the reports for. And then there's a dashboard where they can see an overview of each elephant's scores or do a side-by-side -side comparison of scores between different elephants at their facility. And on the left, you can also see different changes that are represented on the graph by different vertical lines. So we asked facilities to let us know any time that they think any changes have happened which could have had an impact on their elephant's welfare. And these can be changes in management and husbandry, changes in their social environment, so a new elephant comes in or an elephant moves away, changes to the enclosure, so maybe they're made larger or there's some kind of building that goes on, changes in the, the health of the elephant. So anything that they think might have affected their elephant. And on the right, you can see some scores uh, that were graphed um, 
So there, this dotted line here represents when a change happened and the facilities can see the scores on, for different elements of their elephant's welfare before the change happened versus after the change happened. And this graph on the bottom right shows the average scores in three different elephants before a change happened and after a change happened so that they can see how that change might have affected those scores for each individual elephant. Um, and as one can imagine, with this kind of a project, there have been a great many different people and, and facilities involved that have helped to make this project a success. Um, keepers and staff at different elephant holding zoos um, are my colleagues on the elephant welfare group that have worked with me on the behavior subgroup, um, the digital research services team at the University of Nottingham, and we've received funding for this work from the University of Nottingham and also for the UK's Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. Um, I just wanted to also provide a little bit of further information that we've pulled together based on questions that keep coming up from different facilities. So we tried to anticipate some of those and we created uh, a frequently asked questions, which is posted on our website. Um, so the app gets downloaded onto the tablet, either by Wi-Fi or by direct cable transfer from the computer. And once it's on the tablet, it can, it can be used without any internet connection. And the only other time that Wi-Fi is needed is once an assessment's been completed and it's ready to be uploaded onto the database. Um, and so the keeper can just click on this button to upload their results. Um, and then this is just some information about the website data security and website security and details about how the data is stored in the database. Um, and then just to mention that uh, all of these functions, uh, the, the app itself, the automated reports that get generated and the online users portal are available for free. Um, and we thought that was really important so that it can be accessed by all elephant holding facilities globally. And the only condition that we um, make is that we ask for permission to use different facilities anonymized data to help us in our research to better understand captive elephant welfare. Over time, then, we're hoping that this will be one of the largest repositories of captive elephant behavioral data in the world. And this will allow us to scientifically evaluate the information, to learn how elephant behavior is influenced by individual circumstances, and to assess the impact of changes on behavior, like building a new enclosure, or changes in training or husbandry, or if an elephant moves away or a new one comes into the collection. And we can then use this information to help us provide better advice to captive facilities around the globe on what they can do to encourage positive welfare in their elephants. Um, and so for more information, you can look at our website, which is listed there. Um, and we would ask if you could please link to our social media pages and support and, and like our posts. So you, we've got a Facebook account, Instagram and Twitter. Um, and also just to say that if you have any questions, please feel free to contact us at the EWP email address at the university. Um, and so we ask you just to spread the word, encourage colleagues to visit our, our website and to share the links. And uh, for those that are able to, to, to donate where it's feasible um, to support our project. So we're trying to support our project entirely through public fundraising. Um, and thank you very much indeed for your attention. Thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. Oh, a whole lot of information here about elephants. So I appreciate you once again. I would like to take some questions from the chat box. There is a question here. Do you have a standard welfare quality indices for the measurement of body conditions in elephants before the publication of your manuscript in PLOS One? Yes, so to be honest, um, the body condition scoring system was developed by a different group on the elephant welfare group. Um, and they, they did develop one. Um, and actually, there are quite a few different body condition scoring systems for elephants that are available and that have been fully validated using a range of different methods. 
um, I think it's probably important to appreciate that African elephants and Asian elephants have slightly different uh, skeletal anatomy, and so they have different uh, bony prominences. And so a body condition scoring tool needs to be sensitive to the differences between the two different genera of elephants. Yeah, I actually had a question here. I wanted to know the difference between the elef African elephant and the Asian elephant. Apart from the body condition, what else can we use to differentiate them? Probably, do, they, do they make the same sound or things like that or body size? Yeah, so the African elephants are, are larger in body size. Um, they have larger ears uh, than the Asian elephants. The Asian elephants actually they have, uh, they have little... Uh, little tufts of hair on their head. Um, they're smaller, they have smaller ears. Um, only the male Asian elephants will have tusks, the, the larger tusks, the females will have the little tushes. Um, also on the Asian elephants, you'll often see they have kind of a freckly pattern on their ears, especially. So you'll see some depigmented areas uh, often on their ears and, and, and on their faces and trunks sometimes as well. Do they tolerate themselves? Like if you bring the two of them together, do they tolerate themselves or? Do African and Asian elephants yeah. tolerate? Uh, well, I guess that probably has only happened in zoos uh, because obviously in the wild, they, they wouldn't see each other at all. They're on different continents, but mm -hmm. um, I guess probably it, it depends. Um, I, I don't know of a lot of places where that has happened, but I, I do know of, of a couple and, and yes, they, they can tolerate each other. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Is any one of them more aggressive or in terms of temperament? I think, <laughs> I, I think they have the, the, the Asian elephants have the reputation of being more easily tameable or trainable. Certainly there's a much stronger uh, uh, historical tradition culturally of, of using elephants, of taming them and training them to, to, to pull logs. They've used them in warfare. Um, but that said, I have worked with a number of facilities in Southern Africa uh, that uh, have trained their elephants to uh, do different tasks, including using them for giving rides. Uh, so I, I think probably the, the training methods probably have a bigger impact. I think, I think either genus ca can be trained. Oh, thank you so much. And there is another question here from Dr. Samuel Durosharo. He wants to know how reliable is the use of glucocorticoid? glucocorticoids in the measurement of stress level in elephants, I think. Ah, yeah, great, great question. Thank you. It's, it's a really important question. Um, and, and I guess, as I mentioned in my talk, I think it can be helpful. I think in any, in any animal species, it can be helpful. But I think it's really important to recognize that what glucocorticoids measure is arousal rather than stress. Um, and so it's, it's sort of an, a level of excitement. And so if an animal gets very positively excited, if it meets up with other friends, it can be very excited and maybe it's playing and it's boisterous or it's very active, glucocorticoids will increase then. And it doesn't mean that they have bad welfare, it just means they're excited. Um, they can increase when they are stressed, when it, they are experiencing poorer welfare also. And, and I guess then the, the important thing to keep in mind, and this is why we developed our tool, is that really the only way that you can know if those glucocorticoids mean a good positive thing or if they indicate a, a, maybe a bad thing, there's poor welfare, is by using behavior. So behavior can give you that context. Behavior can tell you, are they aroused in a happy, positive way or reproduction, uh, or is it actually they're really, really stressed. And that's why glucocorticoids are increased. The other thing as well with glucocorticoids is that um, they can also decrease with chronic stress. And so we've actually seen these uh, in, in elephants in Peninsula Malaysia, for example, after they were uh, translocated, uh, one of my PhD students that I co-supervised was looking at what happened to the glucocorticoids in elephants that were translocated in Peninsula Malaysia compared to a wild population in the park that weren't translocated. And they actually found that the elephants that were translocated, their glucocorticoids were much lower 
than the levels of glucocorticoids in the wild elephants. And they stayed low for about a year until they gradually climbed back up to the, the sort of the normal baseline levels. And so actually that has really important potential implications for the health and the well-being of those elephants. And so it's, it's quite important. I, I think glucocorticoids can be really important as and as one of a suite of, of indicators to study welfare. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, there is another question. How do you control interpersonality differences in the assessment of QBA, um, in the use of QBA? Yeah. Uh, is that in terms of differences between the assessors, different people that are doing the QBA? Is that what the question's asking? Yes, I think different observers, yeah. Yeah, it's a really it's a good question. Um, and so it, and in an ideal world, um, you would have a few different people doing QBA. And so there are some really good examples where that's done, where you have eight or nine or 10 people that all look at either live or look at a video of an animal and they all make a QBA assessment of the animal. And that way you have more confidence that the result is is kind of more broadly reflective of what's going on with the animal rather than differences in the 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 personality of the pe person doing the assessment um it, for our tool however even if it's being used in a slightly different way by different people it kind of it doesn't matter as long as it's used in a consistent way for a particular elephant so as long as for example it's the same person doing that assessment each time that they do it, then the, the purpose of our tool isn't so much to compare the elephant against some benchmark, some ideal. It's rather to track that elephant's welfare over time. And so as long as that person that's doing the assessment is making that assessment, is using that assessment tool in the same way each time they use it, even if they're using it to a different way to someone that's got a different personality, a different suit, it, it probably doesn't really matter because it will still allow them to see if there are any changes in their elephant over time. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Do you think that as elephants kept in the zoo have their welfare compromised? Oh, <laughs> it, I, the, the, the quick answer to that is it depends. It depends on on. First of all, compromised compared to what, but also which zoo they're in. Because mm. there are a lot, a lot, a lot of different zoos um, and, and a lot of different captive facilities that keep and manage their elephants in different ways. Um, some of them use really harsh physical punishment for training or correction. Um, some of them use positive reinforcement training, which obviously in, allows the elephant, uh, encourages them to, to uh, show their behavior rather than sort of physically punishing them for showing the wrong behavior. And we know that positive reinforcement training in general is something that's being advocated to encourage positive welfare. So it depends on the management methods. It depends on the physical facilities, how, how big the enclosures are, but it's not just the size of the enclosure. We know that if it were just a giant, giant, giant flat grass paddock, well, the elephants might not move around very much in it because there isn't much incentive to do that. So uh, whatever the size of the enclosure, it also depends on how complex it is, what it has inside it. Does it have a nice undulating terrain? Does it have lots of trees in it that the elephant can, can push or, or against or, or pull bark off or, or lots of brows available so the elephant can crunch on the brows and, and, and manipulate it with its trunks. Does it have a soft manipulable substrate for the elephant to play with or to lie on? Um, is there a nice deep pool for them to swim in? Are there other elephants that are compatible with them that they can interact with? All of those things will affect the welfare of an elephant. Um, if we're comparing them against an elephant in the wild, um, Again, it kind of depends because I think we can all agree that elephants in the wild um, don't always have great welfare. There are things that can compromise their welfare if there's drought uh, or scarcity of water or of food, um, if there's poaching happening. So there are threats to their well-being in the wild. Um, but, but also we can say that, uh, that and, and as, as I mentioned a, a little bit earlier in my talk, a big part of, of welfare for any animal, and for us included, is, is having choice, is having control, is having agency. And so 
Um, obviously, they, they don't always completely have that in the wild, but usually they, they have it more than we would expect them to have in a captive setting. But again, it depends a lot on how they're managed as to whether and how much choice or, or control or agency they have. So sorry, it's a really complicated answer to what actually is a fairly complicated question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, thank you. And uh, what are the enrichment materials that you provide for captive elephants? I think you just talked about it, right? Yes. So, so, um, so I don't, I don't directly provide things for the elephants, but I, I try and work with facilities to to encourage them to provide things. Um, and and many zoos. I will say that a great many zoos that we work with um, are, are, are doing this already and, and they knew quite long before we started working with them. Um, and so we're trying to also learn from the best practice that is already used by zoos. So uh, many facilities will um, to encourage natural behavior. Sorry, was that the question to encourage positive yeah, welfare? Yeah. yeah, how can what are the things that can be used to enrich the environment for the captive elephants? Yeah, so I think I think part of it depends on, on how we define enrichment. So in my head, to my mind, there's a lot of stuff that should just always, always naturally be in an enclosure. Um, so when we use the term enrichment, often it's used in a way that suggests it's kind of something extra that we add in to an enclosure at a particular time. And, and arguably, a lot of this stuff should kind of always be there. Some people will talk about just having the physical environment set up in a way that's positive that that's kind of enriching that's a type of enrichment but i would say again a nice big enclosure but with lots of different physical features that we talked about a deep pool to swim in um browse trees to 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 um browse to to, to get shade from um to to pull the bark off browse to to crunch on and and to manipulate with their trunks um a nice deep pool um, potentially, it, it doesn't have to always just be things that are, are natural. Also, there can be some really interesting enrichment devices that are made that encourage um, expression of, of different natural behaviors of elephants. Things like I've seen um, sort of a, a fake tree set up with, with enrichment items sort of up high up so that it encourages the elephant to use its trunk to reach up, to use the muscles, um, think puzzle feeders, things that encourage the elephant sort of co to cognitively, to use its brain and to think about and, uh, and, and try and understand what's going on. There are different, all kinds of different types of enrichment. There can be acoustic sort of auditory enrichment. There can be olfactory enrichment. So adding things that smell different can be really interesting. Different, different sounds, different, different sights, different things to physically manipulate. Um, all of these things, I think, can be very enriching. And, and as I just, just mentioned as well, their social environment it can be incredibly enriching if, if it's compatible elephants. Yeah, oh, that's amazing. I think you have a vast knowledge about this elephant stuff. And uh, we have loads of questions and the questions keep coming in. And I think we still have time to take more questions. Uh, sure. is, the, is the app... This app that you developed for the elephant, can it be used on other herbivorous animals, especially ungulates, or is it specifically for elephants? Well, so ours was specifically designed for use in elephants. Um, and, and so I will say, so the thing is for, for any behavioral uh, or, or any welfare assessment tool, it's really, really important that it gets validated for use in that particular species that you're studying. Um, so we have, have worked with a number of other facilities that have been working to develop and validate tools in other species. So for example, um, there's an MSc student that looked at how to evaluate giraffe welfare. And they basically looked at uh, what we had done to develop and validate our tool as kind of a template for, for what they could then do for giraffe. And so they developed a, a completely new tool for behavioral welfare assessment in giraffes, which is great. And, and so I, I think it, it'd be wonderful. And I would absolutely encourage people to, to do this in other species as well. And if anybody's interested and would like to, I'd be very, very happy to talk to them about that and, and uh, offer any advice or, or uh, suggestions. Yeah, is is the app free and is it available on Play Store? The yeah. app absolutely is free. We oh. didn't post it in the Play Store because we kind of wanted to have the chance to make sure that these are that the people that are using it are, are genuinely people that are evaluating welfare in elephants because 
uh, as I mentioned, the data that's coming from the app is data that we are then using for our research. So we wanted to make sure that it's not just, you know, some, some kid being silly and making stuff up, that it genuinely is people that are evaluating elephants um, and that therefore the, the results that they share with us on our database are results that, that we would then want to use to help our research. So how can people get the app? So people like can... can they can request the app. So on our website, that's the um, elephantwelfareproject.org. It's just all as, one, as if it were one word, elephantwelfareproject.org. Um, if you go on to that, our website, um, there is a, a, a place on the website where you can request the app, request permission for it. And you just fill in a form with some information and then we evaluate that. And, and if Obviously, if it's someone that's genuinely working with elephants, then uh, we'll send them a, a link to download the app. Thank you. And uh, can you talk briefly about uh, Tusk removal and how it affects the welfare of elephants? The Tusk. So, so um, tusks are are basically a modified tooth, um, and so tusk removal is done. Uh, usually for medical reasons, if, for example, the elephant breaks its tusk and it's sort of jagged or um, it's exposed uh, the, the internal pulp if it's high up enough uh, and it's going to be sensitive and painful or a route for infection, um, then the veterinarian might uh, surgically remove the tusk. It, it's not a minor thing. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a pretty major surgical procedure. Um, so I don't think anybody would undertake it lightly. Wow, that is, <laughs> that is good to know. I never knew that is their, their, their tooth. Oh, <laughs> amazing. <laughs> so uh, there is uh, lots of questions. Do elephants produce different sound repertoire, like maybe a sound talking about uh, territory defense and things like that? What yes different kinds of vocalization do they give? Yes, absolutely. Um, thank you. That's an awfully good question. And, and it turns out you won't be surprised to learn that elephants, which are a very, very cognitively complex animal, also have incredibly complicated means of communication. Um, so they will produce a whole range of sounds. And some of them are sounds within human hearing range. And some of them are actually uh, above the human hearing range. So they're in, infrasonic. Um, and so uh, we, we can't hear them, the, and about a third of their vocalizations are infrasonic. Um, and we know that we're kind of just still beginning to unravel what the uh, different vocalizations mean that, that elephants make. Um, and so we know some of them, we understand some of them, some of them we still don't. Um, we know that there are some sounds that they make, both sounds that we can hear and the infrasound that's made in certain particular contexts, so certain particular situations. So, um, for example, trumpeting, which can mean a, a alarm or it can mean excitement. Um, we know that um, there are certain infrasonic sounds that they will make um, to keep in touch with each other. Uh, an estrus female will make a certain infrasonic sound. Um, a, a male that is in must will make a certain characteristic infrasonic sound to kind of advertise his state. Um, must is what I studied for my PhD, so uh, I could go on at not ad nauseum about different things about must. But yeah, they do also make characteristic infrasonic sounds. Yeah. Wow. 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 So, how can you differentiate play behavior and agonistic behavior in elephants? Interesting question. Um, so, so there, there's, there can be a little bit of an overlap sometimes, as, as there can be with any, any species. I mean, we see it with dogs, we see it with, with, with kids, with humans sometimes as well, where play behavior gets a little boisterous. Sometimes it can get a little bit aggressive, um, and, 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 and sometimes it can eventually lead to, to, to proper, genuine aggression, where there's, there's sort of 
uh, more anger and, and less play. Um, so I, I guess it depends a lot on the context. It depends on the ages of the animals involved very often, but, but not always. I mean, adults absolutely can play as well as youngsters can. Um, we would expect youngsters to play more than adults. We, we see that in, in their behavior in terms of frequency. Um, but yeah, I think it, it depends on the, the individual and, and it depends very much on the context, what's happening, what was happening just before they started showing that behavior um, and, and what happens kind of over time if you sort of watch the animal for a while. So it, it is, it's complicated to, to, to necessarily be able to say for sure. So it, it's a very context dependent um, assessment that you have to make. Oh, thank you, thank you. So what does the social structure of the elephant uh, group looks like? Well, so, so elephant society is very much structured around the mother calf. So that's kind of the core relationship is the mom and the baby. And, and, and then elephants will stay very much in, in re immediate family, related family groups. And so in that, that herd, which can be sort of seven, eight, nine, ten individuals, it will be um, sisters, brothers, aunties, cousins, maybe grandma. So there'll be very much that multi-generational family group. And for the female calf, she will live in that, stay in that group usually for, for her whole life. She'll stay in that same family herd. Um, and for the males, for the, the bull elephants, when they reach puberty around 9, 10, 11, 12 years of age, then they will leave their family group. Obviously, that's sort of developed evolutionarily so that they're not breeding with family members. And they will then go out and contrary to what for some reason got into the popular literature, male elephants are not solitary, far from it. They're still very social. Um, and male elephants, they will spend some of their time visiting other family groups. Sometimes they're looking for females to breed. Sometimes they're just being sociable, but also they tend to hang around then with other males. So they form these bachelor herds um, and those males, there'll be some males the same age and there'll be uh, usually at least one older male as well. And whether it's either a female elephant or a male elephant, another really important aspect of, of elephant life is the social learning that happens. So elephants will learn a lot from each other. Um, female elephants will learn how to have calves and how to look after them by seeing other elephants and they're heard doing that. And actually there's a lot of what's called allo mothering where um, female, other females in the herd will help to, to mother and look after a calf. Um, bull elephants, male elephants also will learn will engage in a lot of social learning. They'll, they'll learn how to fight by engaging in play behavior with other bulls of a similar age and size, but they'll also learn how to deal with females, how to mate females by watching older males interacting with females. And, and that, that helps them as well. Um, elephants will learn where to find food and water by learning that from the older elephants who have, have more experience and have lived in that landscape for a longer time. Wow. Um... I uh, learned about allo grooming and today I'm learning allo modern. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, it's really so, important in elephants. But does it mean that, um, let me see, an older female elephant can assist a younger one that maybe once it's close to parturition or during the process of parturition or something? Do they help it themselves? Well, so it, they don't necessarily have to be older, they can be, but it's just other other female elephants um, can help raise a baby, they can help once the, the calf is actually there on the ground, they can kind of help look after it. Um, and they do, it's sort of seen as kind of the, the whole herd basically is helping to, to look after the, the calves. Like a cooperative behavior, we're having a new member to the family, so let's do all we can to make sure that the cow survives well. Very much so, and and you do see ele mothering in other species as well, but it yeah. is definitely present in, in elephants. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Loads of questions. <laughs> What's your take on people that use elephants in circus for entertainment? <laughs> yeah. Um... Yes, I guess, I guess, again, the answer is very much it depends, because 
I know of, of some circuses that use really cruel methods to, to train and correct the elephants, um, where they might keep them in really, really tiny enclosures on really short chains, uh, maybe so short they can't even lie down at night. They may keep them, uh, chain them up so they don't have access to water or to food. They don't have social opportunities to, to interact with other elephants. And then I think that the, the welfare for that elephant is terrible. I think that there are other zoo circuses, um, because this is about circuses in particular, there are other circuses that maybe aren't quite as bad, that maybe they'll uh, have the elephants on a longer chain or they'll take them off chains um, and have them just in enclosure so they can move around freely. Maybe they'll give them the chance to interact with other elephants or give them free access to water. So um, I think I think it very much, very, very much depends. Um, it, it, you know, if you'd asked me when I was much younger, I was very idealistic and I would have said, oh, it's terrible. We should just have elephants in the wild. And at heart, absolutely. I think it would be wonderful if all we, the only elephants we had were elephants in the wild. They could live as they've evolved to do in multi-generational family herds. But the sad, sad truth is that they are going extinct in the wild. They are endangered, both Asian elephants in, since 1986, and now African elephants since 2021 have been declared by the IUCN as endangered. So we know they're going extinct in the wild. And so to my mind, that means that we are going, if we're going to have elephants on the planet at all, it will be in managed or at least semi-managed captivity. And so I feel like we just, we need to learn as much as we can from the different ways that elephants can be managed and, and try and learn how to better manage them in a way that will encourage more positive welfare. That was supposed to be the follow-up question here, talking about how can we conserve them? Because there is a question here that actually said uh, both species are in the endangered animal species list. So the question now is how can we conserve them? And also, uh, if we are tr if we are able to increase the population in the zoo, can we as well? What is the uh, probability of the survival when we release them back to the wild? Yeah, so a bunch of different questions actually, um, and they kind of each have slightly different answers. So I'll try and remember each of them, and I'll start trying to answer them. And, and please remind me if I forget any bits of that question. Um, I guess to start simply, then the first question: How do we conserve them? Um, some of it is we protect their habitat. So a lot of what's happening in the wild is for, for farming, for agriculture, for production of, of wood and production of, of coffee and other food crops and clearing land for livestock grazing is we're chopping down the habitat where elephants live. So we're, we're removing a lot of the wild spaces, the areas that they would normally live in. And that has a number of different really adverse impacts on our wild elephants. It means that, that, um, that, that they've just got fewer spaces to live in, that they, they're, they're kind of trying to compete now for access to water, or, or they're, maybe they're more likely to come into conflict, conflict with humans. And human-elephant conflict is also a really big problem in, in range countries where um, we've got an expanding human population. They're expanding into places that elephants have historically lived. Maybe they're, they're expanding, they're, they've got their, their farm in a place that's a migratory corridor where the elephants move between one place and another. And now they, they have to, either they can't, because fences are up now, they can't use that migratory corridor anymore, or they're going through that, that same migratory corridor, but now they're crashing through people's farms and maybe they do some crop raiding while they're there because they find that, oh, there's some really tasty mangoes growing here. And, and obviously that has really profound implications for the livelihood of those people. Um, you know, that an elephant herd can go crop raiding and in one night they can completely destroy a season's crop. So that's a, a big concern. So I think we need to, there's a few different things that we need to do. I think one is to really make sure that there is no market for ivory, so not buying anything that involves ivory, because that's that's obviously that's the 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 driver for poaching them for their ivory. Um, that we support those folks living in range countries to help them come up with cooperative solutions that um, that don't involve shooting or, or poisoning elephants um, to to try and and 
deal with the fact that they're coming to conflict with them, but also helping support their livelihoods so that we're not just saying, well, you've got to conserve the elephant and too bad for, for, for you and, and you know, your inability to, to now raise food to look after your family. There needs to be a balance. There needs to be a compromise. Um, and there needs to be a sort of a coexistence uh, that is set up for elephants that are living in these wild spaces and sharing it with, with the people there. But also, um, it, for for us in, in in Western countries, for example, if you're going to the to the supermarket to, to buy coffee, uh, it, that it's important to look for the fair trade coffee that's grown sustainably. Um, that's not just chopping down all the elephants' habitat. And the same thing with with paper, with wood products, um, with the you know the appropriate uh, certification that it it has been harvested in a sustainable way. Palm oil at the moment probably. In general, probably just avoiding products with palm oil. I know that there are some places now that are much more sustainably growing palm oils. There are palm oil plantations that are seeking to do that. Um, I think it's probably early days yet. I think if you're able to find products that are made from those sustainable sources of palm oil, that's great. I, I don't think there's any, any reason why one shouldn't uh, support them and quite the opposite. It's great to encourage that. And so to particularly to buy products where that is the case. Um, but I think where that isn't the case to really try and avoid those products. Wow. Uh, sorry, I, I, I'm not sure I got the issue of palm oil and elephant stuff. Wait, sorry. So, so the trouble with palm oil is that it comes from the the oil palm trees, mm -hmm. and those are unfortunately tend to be grown in habitat where elephants live, and so there has has been a lot a lot of clear cutting of elephant habitat to mm -hmm. grow these oil okay. palms. Um, and so, sorry, I didn't explain that very well. I just kind of was assuming everybody knew, and of course you don't necessarily know. So, um, so yeah, there is a real problem with oil palm plantations being grown on the, these lands where, where um, elephants uh, historically live. And so again, there's that, that conflict um, that elephants kind of don't have a place to go because now there are all these oil palm plantations and the, the, the trees and other vegetation that they would have fed off now have been cut down in order to be able to grow these these oil palms. Oh. Oh. Mm. That's, a, that's a big, uh, is a big dilemma because we need to produce more palm oil for people to eat and we are also affecting the world animal. Uh, thank you for this presentation. Uh, since you said that you're, you're, you're trying to monitor those that make use of the app, is is there anyone or has this has this app been used on the boning dwarf elephant? The, I'm sorry, the which elephant? Has this app been used in observing the boning boning dwarf elephant? B o r n e a n. The Bornean, uh, Bornean no, not yet. Not, not yet. Not yet. No, no. Um, we're keen to get it used by people that are studying and working with as many different elephants in as many different settings as possible so that we can better understand, you know, if there are subspecies differences, it'd be really interesting to study that and to understand that better. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that's all we have in the chat box, but I have two or three more <laughs> from... Uh, which I'm interested in. Uh, when you showed us like a pie chart of um, the output from the app, I was able to quickly check for the nighttime observation. And I discovered that uh, about 55% of the, of the time at night was spent by the elephant feeding. So I was wondering why do they feed at night and not during the day or are they nocturnal or what, what, what kind of lifestyle are they, do they yeah. have? Yeah, so actually, as it turns out, um, elephants are quite active and they engage in the wild and feeding and foraging for 16 to 18 hours each day. Wow. And actually, when we when we watch them um, in the wild or, or uh, very often in, in our zoos, we notice that they actually only sleep for two or three or at most four hours in a night. Um, and, and so they're a lot more active than, than we as humans are. Um, and, and so I guess I would say, um, yes, they will be feeding in the daytime, but also they should have the opportunity to feed at night because they will if they can. Wow. Wow. Oh, that means keeping them in the zoo. A, a lot of uh, forages and things will have to be provided. I think this also have to do with the big, the capacity to fill the stomach and things like that. 
Yes, yes. So elephants are hind gut fermenters. So they eat a lot of low quality but high fiber food. And they, because of their gut physiology, they actually need to be eating quite frequently. Um, and and they, one of the problems that we have actually with uh, with a lot of captive elephants is that they actually tend to be fat, at least in our zoos, they tend to be a bit overweight. Um, uh, not all of them, but but certainly that has historically been a problem, and it's something that that zoos, many zoos, are, are trying to address. But but some of that is because, at least in the past, uh, we used to be feeding elephants a lot of kind of high con concentrate food, like a lot of pelleted food that's very nutrient dense, has a lot of calories, and um, and maybe treats that that are very nutrient dense. And actually, elephants haven't evolved to feed that way. They've really evolved to have a lot of forage. And so um, a lot of the facilities that we've worked with, they'll, they're feeding a lot of browse, um, hay. But the great thing about browse is um, it's a lot, of, a lot of roughage in it, a lot of things that they can crunch on as well. It's got a lot of texture, things that they can manipulate with their trunk. So it's very enriching in a lot of different ways, both sort of physically enriching activity stuff for them to do, as well as good for their gut health. Yeah. Yeah, in the wild, uh, I don't know if you've probably observed them in the wild, apart from the zoo environment, do they have a, a, a specific sleeping site and are they consistent in using that place? It probably depends. I would say more that they, they will look for certain characteristics for their sleeping site. So they'll look for something where it's shady um, where it's maybe protected from the rain or from the wind, um, but also, uh, and, and crucially, um, you'll find young elephants, for example, will lie down and the older elephants will kind of form a bit of a protective ring around them, or the young elephants will sleep kind of underneath mom's legs. Um, and so, so um, where they sleep is, is, is slightly dependent on what's sort of available in their environment. And because um, because very often, because of their need to find water or to, um, to, to browse and to forage, they will move quite a bit through the landscape uh, in any given day or time. So they tend not to kind of be back in the same area unless they're in an enclosure and then they will have favorite places to sleep. So in a zoo, absolutely, they will very, very characteristically sleep uh, preferentially in, in certain areas. And particularly um, if they've got the opportunity to pile up sand for themselves or if the keepers have created sand piles for them and the keepers will often do that in the places where they know the elephants like to sleep here anyway, or maybe they'll just create sand piles for them. And then very often the elephants will, will you know, lean against the sand piles. It's a nice soft surface for them to lie on. Oh. So thank you so much for your time and uh, for going through the questions and explaining in details for all of us to understand. So I, the participants, thank you for your time as well. And I believe you've learned a lot. You're free to turn on your video now. And if you have further comments that you want to give to the presenter, please indicate by the raise of hand, using the, the raise of hand button there and I will unmute you. Uh, I think there's one question just uh, <laughs> entered in the chat box. Do, do they immediately feel threatened when they see human beings around their habitats? Interesting one. And, and um, as always, the answer is it depends. And, and part of the it depends that it depends on is what their experiences have been of humans. So what we see is in populations of elephants where they've experienced, where they've been exposed to, to poaching, um, then yes, they will be quite wary of humans. They will be quite alarmed. They will move away rapidly. Um, in places where they're more used to seeing people around that are just maybe tourists taking photos, they might not be quite so fussed, but but that said, a lot of it also depends on who's in the group. So what you might often see is, and, and it depends on how close the humans are, 
what you might often see is if it's a mom that's got a really young elephant, they might tend to be particularly protective. And so the, the matriarch, for example, or, or the mom might either kind of usher the elephants along to move quickly away, or the mom or matriarch might turn and actually threaten the, the person that they see to kind of warn them off. So if I can also <laughs> make this inquiry, because I'm just uh, curious about uh, this uh, elephant behavior stuff. Um, what, how many uh, cows can uh, the, the mother elephant uh, give birth in her lifetime? Or what, what, what is the gestation period, please? So this is a really important one. And, and um, it depends on whether we're talking about captive elephants or wild. With the gestation length, more or less is about 22 months. Yeah. Um, and in general, but it depends a lot on the environment. If there's a lot of food available, then the intercalf interval might be a bit shorter because they can sustain. Obviously, in order for a female to get pregnant and to be able to feed the growing embryo, the growing calf, uh, the growing fetus, they need to be able to have access to good nutrition. They've got to be in good, good shape, good body condition. Um, and if they aren't, then either they might not be cycling properly, or they might not get pregnant, or they might not retain the pregnancy, um, or they might just have a longer interval between when they have their calves. In the wild, in general, we say that they'll be lactating, they'll be feeding the calf uh, fairly intensely for the first year or two. And so they won't cycle. They'll be in lactational anestrus for the first couple uh, of, of years. And also while they're obviously while they're pregnant, then they can't, they won't cycle and they can't, um, they can't uh, get pregnant. And so usually they say the intercalf interval tends to be between four and five years. But that having been said, I have certainly spoken with people who study some uh, wild elephants in Africa, and they said, actually, sometimes they see a female fairly shortly after giving birth, they will start cycling again, and they can get pregnant again. So it's not a, an absolute rule. It, it's a, it slightly depends. Oh, I want to say a big thank you. <laughs> It's a pleasure. Say, on behalf of the participants, I want to say a big thank you for your presentation and for taking time to answer all the questions. And I want to appreciate all the participants as well. And with that, I will hand over to the host to, to do the remaining part of the meeting, Dr. Juru. Thank you very much, Dr. Yasin. Thank you so much, Lisa. I can see uh, that you have really mastered uh, elephant's behavior and welfare. I saw a lot of mastery. <laughs> Thank you so much. And uh, I learned so many new things. I discovered that uh, elephants, uh, they use almost all their days eating, <laughs> which is so funny. <laughs> 16 to 18 hours per day. Yes. On feed. Yes. yes. Honestly, <laughs> there will be a lot of there must be a lot of feed for them if you want to keep them in uh, in zoos and captivity. Yes, they're very expensive yeah. to look after. Yes, and they sleep for just only two to three hours. Yeah, they don't sleep much. Not not in, not normally. Not in the wild. I uh, it's kind of funny to me because uh, uh, I see animals sleep a lot in the night, but they keep on eating in the night. Yes, and the I, other thing. I, I want to believe they have a kind of sight. They can still see very well in the night. That's my belief. I don't know. I think they, they I'm not sure what their, their nighttime uh, vision is like. In general, I would say they, they have really good hearing. Their eyesight isn't as, as good as their hearing. Um, the other thing as well, I guess, to mention about their sleep is that we, in captivity, we see that if they're in a compatible social group, they will actually like to sleep touching other elephants and and in some of the facilities we work with where they've got a big family herd they talk about the elephant pile at night because they literally kind of sleep piled on top of each other so yeah it's really sweet they, there's again i think that how they sleep is is a really important indicator of of how well they get on with each other sand, sand the pile of sand uh, what do they use that to do? Does baiting or what? 
pile of sand, uh, they can use it just, they, they'll use it for, for dust busy and things, but for manipulating with their trunk. But at night uh, or, or whatever time of day when they decide to sleep, um, if the sand pile is high enough, they can kind of lean against it, which can be comfortable, either as kind of like a little pillow or cushion, or indeed for the elephants that have arthritis or foot problems, and we know a fair number of, of captive elephants do, it means that, that if they want to sleep, if they want to engage in that, that delta wave sleep where all the muscles relax and that we know that that type of sleep is really important for cellular regeneration and for health, if they want to be able to do that, but they've got really sore joints or sore feet, if there's a nice pile of sand to lean against, they don't have to be able to lower themselves all the way flat to the ground. So it's easier for them to still be able to sleep if they've got a nice sand pile to lean against. That's very interesting. Thank you so much, Lisa. You know, we are used to listening to uh, welfare and behavior of livestock species, but today we learned a lot of new things about elephants. Uh, before now, we just knew that elephants are very big. <laughs> now we have known so much about them. We have known uh, about their feeding behavior, their resting behavior, and a lot of activities. Thank you so much. Uh, we are really grateful that you joined us. And uh, it, it has been a wonderful experience. Oh, thank uh, you. I, I wrote so many new things. And I want to <laughs> thank our participants. Uh, thank you for joining us today. And I know that we have learned a lot of new things today. And we are so grateful that you joined us today. And we hope to see you in our subsequent meetings and uh <laughs> it was it was it was great today i learned a lot of new things and i know you also learned a lot of new things uh, a few announcements if you can join us on facebook and linkedin our facebook and linkedin is animal welfare group nigeria animal welfare group nigeria and you can also join us on twitter our twitter handle is at awgm14 awgm in capital letter and 14 in number and uh, if we still have people that want to say one or two, one or two things, you can signify by raising up your hand before we end the meeting. Doctor, Dr. Tom, Tom C. here wants to say something. Okay. Yes. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Dr. Yashiri, um, Mr. Samuel, and our presenter for today, um, Lisa. Thank you so much for this informative session. I learned a lot about these big creatures. Uh, trust me, I knew nothing. I will literally say other than the elephants, I can say I know nothing about them. But today I can at least say one or two things about uh, the elephants and not just the elephants, but their welfare. Thank you so much. And I'm um, looking forward to more of this. Um, thank you so much, Animal Welfare Group Nigeria. Uh, let's keep the good work going. And hopefully um, we have more of this in the future. So thank you. Thank you so much. We'll see you. Uh, thank you. And, and I guess I just want to say thank you to, to you for, for hosting my talk, for kindly inviting me. And thank you to everybody who participated and all, all of your really good questions. <laughs> I was imagining that Hannibal uh, been pregnant for 22 months. <laughs> That's a long time. <laughs> it is. Uh, That's almost two years. OK. For me. Fami from Indonesia, he wants to say something. Fami, please unmute. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Dr. Lisa and Dr. Yas and Dr. Samuel mm -hmm. for the, the information today. It's tonight because here is tonight <laughs> and talking about elephant. It's very important because in Indonesia, we have Sumatran elephant, which is, it is very endangered animal. And, and it's like a war when we talk about human elephant conflict, which is, we have to conserve them. But in the other, in, in the other side, we have to see the welfare of human, the life of human, right? But yeah, it is very informative to to attend this um, Zoom meeting. So yeah, thank you for anything and everything. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining <laughs> thank you us. So much. Thank you so much appreciate you. Uh, do we have another person before we end the meeting? Mm. I can see that Safian is <laughs> smiling. <laughs> smiling. 
you want to say something, Safian? Safian? Please yeah, unmute. You, you have please to unmute, unmute yourself. Yeah, please okay. unmute. Yeah. <laughs> Please unmute, unmute. Yeah. Okay, I think I'm on mute now. <laughs> I really want to appreciate uh, Dr. Yasri and um, Dr. Drew yeah. and Dr. Lisa for this kind of uh, informative um, engagement. I think that uh, we have learned really a lot. In fact, uh, we are just trying to put at the organizational level, we are trying to put together something to on the protection of um, elephants around um, certain areas in Ghana, especially the middle belt, because we have a lot of people trying to poach and when the animals tree, they try to kill. And so we want to do some activity around there to protect and preserve, preserve them. So I think that this forum is actually good and informative to us and it will help us a lot in our work. And I think that um, we will keep in touch to get more guidance and assistance as we try to implement our projects. Thank you very much. Thank you, Safir. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so we once again we want to thank everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we are so grateful that you joined our meeting today. We hope to see you in our subsequent meetings. And uh, we want to thank the presenter, Dr. Lisa. You did justice to the topic, and I'm so happy, so happy, and I learned a lot of new things. And I I know that a lot of us learned a lot of new things about elephants. So we know that they are not just big. We know so many other new things about them. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you. you very Thanks much. to everyone. <laughs> um, let me just add that in two weeks time, that will be on the 17th of August, we'll be having a webinar, Talk to Tilt, on the 17th of August. So please watch out on our social media platform so that you can get the link to register. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Safi. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fami. Uh, thank you, Sharon. Thank you, uh, Valentine. Thank you, Dele Peteru. Thank, thank you, Afusat Lady Jobi. Thank you, Luato Sienita. Saeed, thank you so much. You are always joining us in our webinar series. Zino, thank you. Dr. Uh, Tushia, thank you also. We are so grateful. We are so grateful. So, and I can say bye bye. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. you. And bye. bye. Have bye. a nice day. Yeah. <laughs> Jim, bye bye. Bye bye.